Well, we finally made it. We're live pouring this ICF foundation here in Newmarket on Bexhill Road. Uh, had a little bit of a delay this morning. The concrete pump broke down on its way here. And now they're pouring. So if you have any questions around ICF or anything like that, uh, feel free to ask and I will give you answers. I will start by saying ICF construction uh, formulated itself in Europe back in the 80s, actually a little earlier than the 80s, came to Canada or North America back in the, in the mid 80s and has been utilized in um, more custom and high-end construction over the last number of years. Uh, they do a lot of multi-story buildings, condominiums, hotels, different things like that just because of the efficiency and speed of construction. It also is very cost effective. The more complicated the build, it tends to come in line with traditional um, construction at that point. Little bit of things that you'll see what we're doing here and I see people saying hello. So good morning, Louise and Darlene. Um, things about ICF, basically the blocks in this particular case are using Amvic blocks. Uh, they're 16 inches high per course by about four feet long. The block I used to use was a company called Nujura. The blocks there are typically eight feet long by 18 inches high. So the assembly is a little quicker. It just kind of boils down to pros and cons of either or. Um, as you can see, he's pouring right beside a uh, window right now. So the window is all bucked in and reinforced with wood, which typically stays in place. So you can screw your windows in easily after and you'll get a lot of vibration. He's on his first course of pour right now. He'll go around three times. And what'll happen is they typically, you'll see some orange turnbuckles in the background behind them. They'll tow in the walls so that that way, as the concrete drops down in, the walls will vibrate loose a little bit. Not, not loose, but they will tend to move and move outward. So by turning the turnstiles in, it's easier to push the walls back straight than to try and tow them in after the pour. One thing that's really good about ICF, uh, your quality and level, uh, getting to pre-build before you build the house, you're always typically going to have better quality control because you spend more time pouring footings that are level. Uh, just due to the sensitivity of the ICF blocks, they need, uh, they need decent straight level uh, footings to be able to lock together. One thing about ICF as well, um, it's basically like a giant Lego block. There's little um, nipples for lack of better words on each course and then there's it's like a fe male female lockdown system. Uh, when you put them together they lock interlock with themselves just like a Lego block and then you fill one course of rebar horizontally per section or level as you rise and then you put vert vertical rebar in as well. Concrete that goes in here is a little different than what you would see on a traditional pour. Uh, most times in traditional foundations you're going to find that they're using three quarter inch aggregate um, and they use a lower MPA, usually 15 to 20 MPA. So it's a little softer. Uh, when you deal with ICF they tend to use a 10 mil aggregate so it's like a a three eighths versus three quarter. And the reason for that is if you put three quarter into these because there's so much uh, plastic webbing that you can maybe see and steel in there, uh, if you don't go to the smaller aggregate, you're gonna get a lot of hang up in the concrete and you can end up with voids. So this stops that. And you also run a looser slump, if that means anything to some of the people that'll understand construction, meaning the concrete's more watered down as it goes in. Uh, another great benefit to using ICF construction is the only way that the concrete can cure is by curing out of the top. And you always want concrete to cure nice and slow uh, because if it, it dries too quickly, it has a tendency to shrink and then possibly crack. And in ICF construction, you don't get that. So uh, it really can only evaporate its water content out through the top of the, uh, the pour once it's done.
So Brian, I see you asking about interior walls. Typically you don't do your interior walls out of ICF because it's just too cost prohibitive. At that point, um, you either do just regular stick framing or steel or you can do concrete if needed. A lot of times in hotels and condominiums, all they ever do is pour the exterior walls in ICF and then all the interior walls will be done and just standard um, forming because there's no need to have the protection of the insulation uh, of the styrofoam. This is more about thermal energy. Um, the ICF block is two and five eighths outer and then a two and five eighths inner course of um, styrofoam in terms of thickness. So before there's even concrete in it, these walls are performing at about R23, which is equivalent to what most standard homes are built with. Um, the difference between this is once you pour in the concrete, you typically get a performance rating, especially here in Canada, because we have such drastic swings in our daily temperatures, uh, that it, it typically performs at about R35 to R40 consistently. It can go up as high as R50, and it never declines. Uh, unlike standard built homes um, where the insulation will dry out and shrink and move in the walls, uh, you just don't have that with um, ICF construction. The other thing that you'll find with ICF, uh, yes, it is made from fossil uh, materials, so it is um, built with petroleum-based products. Um, a lot of concerns sometimes people have is that um, if there's ever a fire, it's very toxic, they do put fire retardants in it, uh, so typically the only time that this stuff will ignite and burn is when there's a flame at it. As soon as the flame's extinguished, it will go out. And a lot of people say, well, it's still highly toxic. Well, everybody in the industry kind of has the attitude that no matter what kind of fire you have, it's going to be toxic. And if you're in it, it's not going to be good. So, you know, there's pros and cons to everything. Uh, this is about efficiency, really, at the end of the day. Better quality. Um, these houses are proven to withstand F4 hurricane or F4 um, tornadoes without really any type of structural damage. The only thing that typically gets damaged in any type of hurricane or tornado is sometimes uh, materials impregnating the uh, styrofoam itself or you know you typically see the windows blown out and the roof sucked off of houses but uh, ICF construction will typically withstand anything Mother Nature puts at it short of being in an ocean. So Louise, you're saying uh, about cost effectiveness. Um, typically it's always been that ICF construction, especially of late because it's being used more and more, on a standard build will cost you about 10% more for the construction side of it, uh, just due to material costs and um, you're using a lot of steel versus just a standard pour where it's only concrete so you pay for the form blocks and a few other things but uh, it comes back in the efficiency less issues with warranty and cracking um, it's only ever as good as the people that are pouring it you know unlike when you're doing standard traditional forming they can tend to see where there's problems if they pour and cut it out and remove it and replace if there happens to be voids um, if you're good at what you do, as you can see, Paul's checking down the down the wall there just to make sure that there is no issues and uh, they're vibrating it as well so that they can take the air out of it. Um, ICF though, if there's voids, you typically won't know it. However, if you've done your job right, there won't be voids. When I was doing this type of construction, we were always typically going around tapping the walls, making sure there was no hollow spots. Uh, it's fairly, standard in terms of doing a pour you really there's not much guesswork to it yeah and brian you're saying about how quiet icf is um typically when you're inside one of these houses the weakest point of anything in these houses is windows uh and or doors so if you've done good windows and doors and they're installed properly, these houses are uber, uber quiet. You can put them right beside a railroad track, highways, anything like that. Very, very quiet. So 
now they're moving back outside the wall. They're probably going to just finish um, pouring the bottom trough by the front of the garage. And then they will move back into doing the uh, inside tall walls. And I see a concrete truck's also pulled away, so we're waiting for our second concrete truck to show up probably shortly. Yeah, Louise, the setup time is uh, pretty much the same. Hey, Brent. <laughs> you ought to know about all this. Um, setup time is pretty much the same. Uh, one difference is you take a little longer in doing your footings. Uh, it's critical to really get them straight and proper, especially in a case like this where you have step down foundation. Um, you just really want to spend your time in the footings. And then assembly, you know, for people that have just gotten into it, as Brent Cook can tell you who's watching, um, who used to be on one of my crews with me, he um, can tell you that, you know, the first couple times you're doing this, you're really going at it with caution and trepidation a little bit because it's, uh, it's kind of you're in an unknown until you do one of these. Um, but once you really get into it, a house like this, if you are really into a system and have a good crew, uh, it'll take you a day to do the footings. Strip the footings, put the gravel in, put your weepers in, and basically you can start assembling the next day. If you have a good crew on a foundation like this, nine feet high, it's about a 1,200 square foot perimeter wall, um, you can basically assemble one of these in maybe two days. It just really depends on how complicated it is. This one has a lot of structural steel on the front wall um, because there's big door openings and a garage door opening there so there was a lot more engineering that had to go into it to make sure the rebars in the right places doing the right amount of uh, structural or giving the right amount of structural integrity for the garage yeah, it's good to see you tuned in brent it's been a long time And in the case of this house, we are on Bexhill Road in Newmarket, so we're just off Main Street north of Davis Drive. So if anybody ever wants to come by and see what's going on, uh, there will be two of these houses built here. Um, we're built onto a high part of the hill, so the ICF construction just made really good sense in this case, uh, just because we're built into a heavy, heavy slope here. And ICF construction, because of the nature of its engineering, is always just going to be a lot stronger than conventional builds. So it'll take a lot of um, back pressure from, you know, when you backfill the walls beside it and behind it uh, versus conventional foundations. You know, you'd have to, in a case like this, no matter what, um, do some reinforcement even if you were building conventionally. So it just makes more sense to go this route. Hey, Gina. That's it. Get out door knocking because I'm not today. <laughs> what they're going to do here as well too is they are only going to pour the basement on both of these houses and then they're going to go back to conventional construction here um, just because the the builds aren't terribly complicated in nature by uh, you know the size and what they're doing so it just uh, there's no point in going to convention or uh, ICF right to the roof you wouldn't get the price point here that you would need to warrant doing that type of build unless the client wanted to pay for it. What are we door knocking for? Well, being realtors, everybody knows that it's usually prospect for new business from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. And Gina and I are door knockers. We don't do phones, so we basically get out in the neighborhood and go and say hello to people. Yeah, Brian, the retaining wall here, you can't really see it, um, but I'll, another day, uh, I'll be here off and on throughout the course of the uh, build here, and 
I'll actually uh, talk about the retaining wall another day. The retaining wall here spans across both properties, so it's actually about 120 feet long uh, and at its highest point, probably about 25 feet high. And uh, I've got pictures of the property prior to it all going in, so it'll give people a sense as we move through the construction phases here as to what was done and uh, the kind of uniqueness of the property. And the guy you can see in the background there with the uh, yellow rain jacket on, that's Paul. He's the builder here. Really good guy, knows his stuff. Uh, I met him through when I was contracting and doing ICF construction. So we used to do work back and forth. And he was the right person for these kinds of lots. Uh, these lots here are not for rookies at all. It even took quite a long time for, um, for us to get these properties sold uh, just due to the nature and complexity of them. So if you have more questions, ask away. Yeah, Gina, I've already told him that uh, I've got a good real estate team for him when he's ready to sell these. And Brandon, yeah, the, uh, the ICF, if you have any questions, just ask. Um, I'm probably not covering half of what I know yet. I'm kind of question driven. Uh, one thing I can say too about these, uh, these pours is um, typically what you're going to find in construction when you're pouring these you typically don't want to build them over 12 to 13 feet high in a pour uh, and just for the reason is you're dropping the concrete a long way down into the bottom and even though the uh, forms are reinforced with plastic webbing uh, the further the uh, concrete drops by virtue of gravity it'll have a tendency to blow out the bottoms so we we never usually pour more than 12 13 feet high at a time and uh, in this case it's a nine foot wall and then what you would do if you were going to do a continuous pour going up, say building uh, main floor and second floor, is you would um, extend rebar out of the tops of the foundation here and you would pour up to the top of the walls like they're doing right now. You'd let it cure, then you'd basically come back uh, next day, two days later, and start assembling the uh, second or main floor walls in this case and second story walls and what you do when you start assembling is you'd actually uh, there's hanger systems that you can embed into the concrete here and then put all your um, your flooring trusses or your flooring joists in so that you have a deck to work on and you can then work on the main floor you're not working on scaffolding or ladders at that point point. Um, and then you just do a cold pour so basically that means they would pour up to the top of the wall here you'd start reassembling the main floor once you've assembled the main floor, you just pour on top of the existing concrete that's there and it would just be called a cold pour. So they just put in a, a primer and you'd have the rebar sticking out that you just wire tie to and you have your integrity maintained from one pour to the other. So Louise, the subfloor in this case will sit right on top of the walls here. It'll extend out. If you were going to build um, if you were going to build the whole house in ICF, you'd actually, they have a hanger system that just, you stick right through the uh, styrofoam and it goes into the concrete. So once the concrete's poured, uh, it becomes a part of the, it, it becomes integrated into the ICF pour, so it'll never move. And then just like you have deck hangers, uh, you do the same thing here. It's just a larger hanger uh, based on whatever you're using for floor joists and tends to be a lot straighter uh, it boils down to again whoever's doing the construction side of it good crew means good build bad crew means bad build it's like anything exactly brent you've been there you've done it 
One thing that's good about Amvic too, unlike um, all the other ICF manufacturers, they actually have a uh, styrofoam uh, reinforced tubing system that you can actually uh, do all your decks and concrete as well. So if you were using a Nujura like I used to, you'd have to do a corrugated pan like they do in apartment buildings and under, underground garages. Um, so this stops you from having to do all that and gives you a higher R value within the interior of the house from one floor to the next. Yeah, it will be a lot stronger, Louise, because you're, in this case, unlike a standard foundation that really usually will have no steel in it, um, you're putting 10 millimeter thick steel uh, on these walls, one, cor one per course laterally, and then usually depending on how the engineering is or the height of the wall, you'll have one vertical course of rebar. Uh, most cases you just use 10 mil, sometimes they'll specify heavier. Uh, so you sometimes have to step up to a 15 mil rebar, so you're, you're talking in thickness conventionally of uh, approximately 7 sixteenths on 10 mil and then um, roughly 5 eighths a little heavier if you're going to 15 mil. And then everything's wire tied. In most cases, some guys do, some guys don't. Yeah, no, it won't move, Louise. These houses, once they're done and set up, they are incredibly strong. And now we're just waiting for another concrete truck, so as soon as the next concrete truck gets here, they'll start re-pouring. So if you have questions, keep asking. I thought I smelled something burning, Louise. Yeah, you know I wouldn't let the day go by without me abusing you a little. <clears throat> so Brandon, on a comparison of cost, um, ICF is typically running usually about 5 to 10% higher than conventionally built um, homes. Um, and reason being for that is just because the cost of the block and you have a lot, uh, you know, a lot of steel cost. Uh, steel these days has gotten quite expensive and you no matter what have to reinforce these walls because you are using less concrete. Uh, in this case as well, I can talk a little bit about that. Um, a standard wall on a, on a typical home is usually eight inches in uh, thickness. Here we're actually doing a six inch pour. Um, down at the bottom, because of the property line being really tight on this one, you can't see it here, but there's what's in called an internal brick ledge. So what you do is, in this case, um, because brick is usually sat on a four inch ledge, you, in this case, use a six inch block and down on the bottom, wherever your brick row is going to be, you use a 10 inch block. And that allows the, um, it allows the brick to sit on top of it. Uh, there are, with different manufacturers, brick ledge. There, there are with different manufacturers brook, uh, brick ledge that is actually integrated into the block so it just actually forms out a little saddle. In this case you just uh, use a smaller block. 
However, it allows you to uh, maintain your maximum footprint uh, without stepping out like you would normally with a, an integrated um, brick ledge. So cost-wise, getting back to that, Brandon, uh, again, 5 to 10% more. Um, you're quickly going to realize it, though, in cost savings when you're heating and cooling. Um, I can tell you in houses like this, this time of the year, you wouldn't even have your heat on. Typically, the lighting uh, and people being in the house would be enough to heat a house like this and keep it at 65, 70 degrees consistently. Uh, even in spray-foamed houses I, I've owned myself, um, we've literally, in the, in the dead of winter, shut off the uh, basement diffusers and uh, with just having pot lights and things on and people in the house, you can generate enough heat that you actually have to open the windows. So we're waiting for concrete so if you have questions keep asking because this is like watching paint dry at this point well maybe what I'll do is I'll actually pick up the camera and um, show you the retaining wall I'm standing on a portion of it here so bear with the uh, jiggling I'm gonna pick up and show you what's going on here with the site a little bit So there's looking down the wall here. So there's two properties here. We were built into one heck of a large slope. Um, basically there was about, uh, if I re remember right, from down at the sidewalk down there up to the top of the property, approximately a 14 meter rise. So we were um, somewhere around 36, 37% rise from the front to back of the property. And there's a concrete pump. This particular one, I believe, is 38 meters. Um, so that, you know, basically means it has about a uh, oh, 150 foot reach. So from the the mast there, straight out, if it had to, it could read about reach about 150 feet away from the truck. Yeah, it is a huge slope. In this case, um, I'm going to set the phone back down. In this case, I had these properties for sale and sold a couple times. And, uh, you know, it was a complicated land deal just by virtue of the fact that uh, you definitely don't want to be a rookie building into these types of things. Uh, there's just a lot of stuff that could go wrong. And if you don't know what you're doing, you lose your shirt really quickly on these types of properties so it, it even took quite a long time to um, get them sold i had these properties for sale for over a year uh, in a in a marketplace where typically everything's gone in five days or less um, so it was great by virtue of um, the fact that i had a really good seller who is also a builder himself and uh, needed the right builder to come along which is who we found in this case and um, you know, they've just, they're just they top quality. So these houses, when they uh, go back out on the market, you couldn't ask for a better builder to be building your house. Yeah, Louise, there, uh, there can be a lot of stress. I mean, um, it really depends. You know, uh, in this case, there was a lot of town issues, had to overcome a lot of hurdles. Um, they really didn't want to even see these sites develop just because they've been sitting here so long. And uh, there was a lot of trees. So in this case, we had uh, a lot of mature trees in here. Um, so there was some tree preservation that had to come in into effect and still the trees had to be removed just by virtue of the fact they were in the way so when you have tree preservation which a lot of municipalities have anything over 30 centimeters in diameter is typically protected so what it means is it doesn't stop you from 
possibly cutting down the tree it just means that you're going to have to replace a number of different um, a number of different uh, trees based on whatever the town specs Well, I guess I could probably, uh, I don't see anybody asking questions at this point, so I can um, stop the shoot for now and possibly come back on in a little bit when the second truck's here and people can see how things just keep moving along. All right, I'm waiting, Louise. You're welcome, Brandon. Anything else you need to know? What time for what, uh, Lori? And yeah, I can look down the wall, Louise. It's uh, I'm on a lower point of the wall. Um, again, I'll show you the high point over there in the center is oh, approximately 25 feet high where I am here. Um, we're talking maybe 12, 14 feet. And yes, I do have my fall arrest. Yeah, I don't know what time it is either, uh, Lori. Can't see it with this thing running on live, and I don't have a watch on. It's got to be somewhere around 10:15. Oh, the second load. Yeah, the second load should be here any time. So um, I can either sit here filming and we can all talk, or I can um, put this on hold for a bit and come back when the uh, second truck's here. Should have been here already though. Of course I have my hard hat on. Lori knows. Helmet on for safety. Ten forty five. Holy mackerel. Days flying. Donnie. Yeah, I miss good old Donnie. I can't prove it. I'm not putting my camera on myself. Come on. Oh, and our second truck is coming right now. So it'll take them probably about five minutes to set up and away we go. A little bit of stuff I can talk about about the concrete in this case too. Um, part of why you pay a little bit more in construction cost for um, ICF is because you're running a, a tighter aggregate so they have to put more in and it just costs more to produce. So um, in this case because you're using a uh, 10 mil aggregate or 3 8 um, you have a little bit of an elevated cost in the concrete this time of the year they're also running heat in the concrete so it uh, even though we don't have risk of frost yet um, you could get it at any time so they're already putting uh, additives into the concrete to stop it from freezing you typically don't have that issue any time of the year with icf uh, 
whether you've got heat in it or not because of the fact that it's um, coming out of the factory at 65 70 degrees um, the concrete will maintain not freezing by virtue of the fact it's sitting in that insulated forms which again are sitting at you know you're performing at r22 just before you even put concrete in them the only thing you ever see freeze when you pour uh, icf homes is just the top layer uh, once you've stopped pouring so what we always used to do was just um, place wood over them or more styrofoam just to protect them in the overnight hours when uh, we wouldn't be on the site saved by the truck yes we are You wouldn't want to have to listen to me all day. Another thing that's really good about ICF2 and anybody that's worked in it, um, depending on the block manufacturer, um, I'm not, I don't know about Amvic. I know they're very comparable to Nujura and their capabilities of what they can do right out of the factory but i'll speak about new jura that i used so um quite often you'll see in in homes they'll have um half round walls or 45s but uh if you had a half round wall the one thing that's really good about uh, new jura in particular is that you can tell them the radius that you're going to build so if it was say a 15 foot radius wall um you give them the drawings and right at the factory they actually manufacture the block with the radius all intact for the inside and outside so you don't ever have to think about anything or cut it's all pre-done right at the factory for you so you never have any issues with coming out onto the job site and having to um, remanufacture any of the icf block or cut it and bugger around with it it just takes all the thinking out of it and unlike conventional builds, when you try to build a uh, radius wall, you use a huge amount of wood to do it, and uh, it takes a lot longer, and um, you, know, you tend to have more quality issues unless you've got a really good contractor on side that knows what they're doing when it comes to those kinds of walls. <clears throat> now, Louise, what you do is Prior to the pour, you tow in the walls. Um, so those turnbuckles that you can see in, in the background there, the orange pieces, um, they actually spin and it allows you to tow in the walls. And um, you almost always tow in an ICF wall unless you've got support on both sides, just because what'll happen is as you drop the concrete down the, uh, the hollow walls, you get a lot of vibration and it tends to make the walls um, move outward if they're not towed in uh, they won't down at the base because everything's pinned and styrofoam to the uh, footings but just the vibration of pouring around the few times will tend to cause the walls to uh, move a little bit so by having them towed in it just makes it really easier to have a straight wall because if you built the walls just straight and they start to bounce out and bow out uh, it becomes really hard to pull the walls in at that point, so it's always best to just tow them in and push them back straight after the pour. So what does it mean to tow in the wall, Lori? It means it's basically concave when you pour it. So it's like walking through a ditch, um, you know, for lack of a better way to explain it. The bottom of the wall will be completely straight, but at the top, it'll be bowed in like a bowl. Uh, so, you know, like a cereal bowl or anything like that, it's just valleyed uh, so that that way you can push it back straight when the pour is done. Because of the weight of the concrete and everything after it's done, if you had to try and pull it in, it would be uh, really hard to do. Oh, 
I'm losing my audience. All right, well, they'll be ready to start pouring again in a second, so keep asking if you have any questions. No, you don't adjust during the pour, <clears throat> just because uh, you don't know what's gonna happen during the pour, so it's always best to wait until you get right to the top of the wall. And what we've always done is at that point, uh, when I was doing pours, um, we'd either eye shot it or just put a string line out from one end to the other and tow the walls back until they're straight. Ah, that's good, Louise. I knew you'd be faithful till the end. Or at least until my battery dies, one or the other. <laughs> awesome job, Lori. So now you'll see that one guy that just picked up that tool on the other end. Um, usually when you go around the first course, you don't typically run the vibrator uh, just because it can sometimes get hung up in all the plastic webbing and steel down the wall. Uh, so now what they're doing is where they're standing, that's a cold room, um, and they're going to pour that out first uh, just because there's brick ledge on the other side. Uh, so they'll pour that right up to the top likely. and. Uh, take all the air that's out of it by virtue of using a vibrator so that way uh, it helps the concrete to become stronger yeah I do Lori um, the guy there with the uh, yellow jacket that's uh, a friend of mine Paul and his brother beside him and um, I've known these guys uh, oh probably six seven years was contracting probably around the time that uh, we first started going out to the campground um, when I was still contracting I met Paul through the uh, ICF world um, he's always been an ICF guy and uh, we were too so we just crossed paths and started doing work back and forth <laughs> biting your tongue let the explanatives fly Lori or I mean Louise You're killing me, people. You gotta ask some questions here. Gina's very good. I don't know if you know or not, Lori. Uh, she left um, her work and came on with me full time in September. Um, I had an incredibly busy year, so it was at the point that I needed to have the help, and it made the most sense with her having her license to uh, come join me. So now it's uh, it's great. She's actually probably watching this. She might be out door knocking now. I don't know. Uh, she was watching earlier. And um, we're doing well. We're actually heading to Tennessee on, on Friday after school. The kids uh, have a week's uh, reading week. So um, we're taking the trailer down and uh, heading to the Smoky Mountains for a week. And then coming back and push through until we leave in December and go back down to Florida for a vacay. Well, thanks, Lori. Like all of us, we've had our ups and downs. Oh yeah, Tennessee. 
So where they are right now pouring is right over the garage. There's a, a huge amount of steel um, rebar sitting in that uh, cavity. So that's roughly about 22 inches high by around 16 feet in uh, length. Uh, so they really have to be careful with um, pouring in through there. Uh, that's one of the most important parts of the house right there, especially because it's going to be carrying two stories of house, uh, you know, on top of it. So there's a lot more steel sitting in that cavity. Sounds good, Lori. I know I've seen some of your posts that uh, you were heading down east. Yeah, I love Tennessee. Uh, we're actually going to head down just um, in Gatlinburg and Pigeon Forge, just outside of Knoxville. It's a great state, one of my favorites. So now they're um, going into the far end of the house and he hasn't poured anything in there yet, so you may be able to hear a lot of the uh, noise. And that's just the concrete dropping all the way down to the bottom of the wall. That's where you have to be the most careful when you're on the tall portions of the wall and you're doing your first go around. Uh, that can be sometimes where you'll get a blowout uh, on the styrofoam at the bottom. So the green thing is called a, a concrete pump or a pump truck and I was saying before in that case um, Lori this particular truck can reach approximately 140 feet straight out so from where you see the main boom on the truck on the right side of the screen if you had to extend his arms straight out away from the truck they could get about 140 feet reach So this particular pour is going to take roughly 28 meters, um, so it'll be just about three trucks. Um, I think they've got 10 meter trucks here, maybe. So usually it'll, uh, you'll get nine to 10 meters on a truck. Uh, in this case, it'll be three. Yes, it does beat pushing wheelbarrows. Uh, been there, done that. This is a whole lot easier. Another thing I can talk about in the uh, construction side of this, so what's really good about the um, ICF is you, if you can see it, um, there's vertical bars or channels that are running up the wall there and what you do is every course you actually uh, screw the um, ICF block. There's webbing that's uh, built into there, uh, plastic webbing that's in behind the styrofoam and you screw the channel to the wall that then causes it to stay nice and stiff and straight and then the orange turnbuckles get mounted onto it so it allows you as I was talking before to tow the wall in and out and also provides you the element you need for the scaffolding that the guys are standing on so it's really a multi-purpose system and um, great safety for the guys and just allows for better quality control hey Barry long time no talk
So one of the parts that you always have to be a little careful of, um, and they've gotten better over the years with the ICF, is that the corners were typically um, an area where you can have blowouts, uh, just by virtue of the fact that they used to have sharp corners on them, so they'd be a complete 90. Um, over the years, they've actually rounded the corners on the inside, so it allows the concrete to flow better coming into corners. But you always still have to kind of watch corners, because that's where you can get some piling up and um the concrete you know just doesn't flow as well around the corners yeah so what happens with the concrete truck it um, pours into the back of a hopper i'll actually show you right now um, he's backed up to the back of the pump truck so there's a trough on the back of the pump truck and then there's two large pistons that are um, buried internally in that um, trough. And what it does is it essentially sucks in concrete, puts it under pressure and shoves it up through the tubes in through the mast and then delivers it out on the other end. So the good thing about how it's done that way is that um, you have very little air um, when they pump it like that versus if you were to just pick up concrete and pour it, it'll have a lot more air in it because it's under pressure. It tends to take a little bit of the air out of the uh, concrete. Uh, so you don't have to do usually as much vibrating, but you still, you have to vibrate because once it falls down into the walls, it's just natural gravity at that point. So it does pick up air again. Well, you know, Lori, it's discipline. They teach you this in real estate. Stand still, hold still, listen. You know, we do everything with discipline. Actually, I've got a tripod. I got a selfie stick. But I'm just not going to put my selfie on camera today. Kind of being selfish that way. Well, that happens, Louise. I can't help you with that one. And you have to be careful with the vibrator. You can see um, Paul's brother down at the end of the wall there. He's starting to vibrate. You always have to um, watch a little bit because the vibrator can get hung up in the uh, steel and webbing. And if it does, it's always best just to shut it off. Uh, we have had experiences where um, the vibrators got hung up and if you don't turn it off quickly enough, it'll cause the uh, styrofoam to bulge and you potentially could blow out a uh, section of the block. Another thing that's really good, um, you can see in behind Paul, a guy's head just sticking over the wall. That's the pump truck operator. And they uh, work on remote controls. So he's operating the truck via remote. And it's always good to have these guys on site. This particular company, Premier, um, the pump trucks are owned by a company that actually sells these uh, ICF blocks. And for anybody that's ever doing ICF pours, it is always, always, always a really good thing to have pump truck uh, companies on site that are familiar with ICF pours because the, the guys running the trucks know what to watch for uh, because there are certain elements of um, blowout risk and things uh, when you're doing ICF pours. So you just uh, want to be on top of it and by them watching for those things, they can um, you know stop pouring concrete before it becomes an issue. And then you're running to uh, fix uh, blowouts and by blowouts, I mean, typically you'll only ever have a small section of a wall blowout, and it is usually where you go from 
uh, one block to another because there's a joint so it is a weak point uh, over the years the ICF companies have developed internal hangers that you put in so it helps keep those joints stiffer so not having as many blowout issues as you used to but on a joint um, sometimes you can have a blowout and if you do usually it'll just blow a hole in the wall about the size of a dinner plate and then the concrete just oozes out and the easiest thing to do is just let it ooze out until it stops and go get a piece of plywood screw it onto the wall and go back to your pour So Lori, what they usually do on a concrete pour like this where you're doing a full height wall is they'll go around in three um, courses. So you'd go around the first pour and do three or four feet up the wall and then you'll do a second go around and then you'll do your final go around and um, just keep vibrating as you're going and uh, take the air out of the walls and at the very end if they have to do any top up they do. Um, so. It goes pretty quickly. Uh, the pours are typically just about as quick as you would do on a standard pour. Uh, maybe takes a little longer just because you're being a little more cautious and uh, quality control is more imperative than when you're in a strip form type of pour. Yeah, you really... Um, that's a good point, uh, Lori. Uh, unlike conventional pours uh, where they're typically forming up and pouring right away, so you've got all your laborers on site. Um, if you were doing a house like this and you were doing it for yourself, you could actually do the whole thing um, almost by yourself. You really only need one guy holding the chute like Paul, Paul is and one guy uh, vibrating concrete. Uh, you really don't need more than two people on site anytime during uh, an ICF type of build. Uh, it certainly makes for more efficiency if you've got guys on site, a number of laborers, because then you can assemble the walls quickly. However, at the pour stage, really two, three people will be all you need because uh, once they get to the top of the wall, uh, they'll just start to trowel off. As you can see, one guy's coming up with his trowel, so they're going to get ready for that, and then they'll set all their pins. And um, that's it. Hey Heather, good to see you. Well, not see you, and you can't even see me, but you know what I mean. You probably know we were by your place the other day. Oh, anytime, Lori. I'll actually be coming. Uh, I'll be coming throughout the build here um, as I can fit it into my schedule and uh, show different points. So I'll do some Facebook live sessions throughout the whole build um, so that people can get a sense of how construction is done. If people don't know it, it's kind of fun. I miss it. I love real estate. I also love contracting. Real estate's certainly less messy most days. Yeah, I, is, is George, uh, he does forming as well, Louise? If he does strip forming, I mean, it's a way different environment. Uh, those guys are typically under pressure to perform at uh, higher scales and quicker pace because they're doing uh, forming on mass. Uh, and that's why a lot of builders actually just go to um, uh, strip forming because they can just go from one basement to the next, to the next, to the next. Um, and do it in massive labor. Uh, ICF tends to be more specialized and you have to be more conscious about quality. And for a lot of mass builders, um, 
it's more about the bottom line for them. You know, everything they do to get things done as quickly as possible saves money at the end of the day. ICF is a whole different beast. If you're talking about ICF, um, typically there isn't screw-ups. The only thing uh, we've ever experienced is uh, blowout. Um, and it happens less and less because since I got into the business doing it, uh, they've engineered it even more and um, you know they know where the weak points were so they've developed product to uh, stop any of that. So these days, um, quality is top-notch. Yeah, custom home builds is the best way to go. I mean, it was the biggest reason I got into ICF construction. Uh, we no longer had to rely on waiting for uh, form guys or block companies to show up. Um, and it just allowed us to have complete control of our work site. And if I'm warranting the product, it just made me feel better at the end of the day that um, I was involved in uh, doing exactly what you see here. So we, we just had a complete quality control mentality. Yeah, that's another thing that's uh, good what you're saying about beam pockets. Um, you know, the one thing that's really good about ICF uh, is that you do a little bit more pre-planning. So on the far side of the wall, you can barely probably see it. Um, there is a beam pocket hole already there, so they've already put the cavity in because they know what size beam's coming. So they've already pocketed that and they're just pouring concrete around it. So what'll happen is when the steel beam shows up here, they'll just drop it right into those pockets. You don't have to even cut anything. Way less stress, whole different environment. Yeah, typically it is, Lori. You really have to be when you're dealing with ICF um, because once the the pump truck shows up and concrete, you know, you're talking these days, I don't even know what concrete costs anymore, but when I was pouring, it was running anywhere from $135 to $150 a meter. So, you know, every truckload sitting out on the street is potentially $15 to $16, $1,700 worth of concrete in the back of the truck and uh, concrete pump uh, again i don't know what they're charging these days but when i was doing it six seven years ago uh, concrete pump would be for this size of pump about 175 dollars an hour and you'd have a four hour minimum so you know right away um, it's really Im imperative to be efficient at what you're doing because uh, you hold up these guys that cost big money and they just keep the meter running like a taxi and concrete's only got so much um, sit time before it goes bad and once it goes bad you own it and if it's garbage you have to also pay for it to get dumped What they also do is they go up the wall here, um, and Louise, you, you know, George will probably end up watching this later or talk about it, but uh, typical walls will run 15 to 20 MPA, which is uh, hardness factor of concrete. Um, 
What's good about ICF is they run a higher MPA, so they're typically running a 25 MPA. But because of the fact of how they cure the walls by virtue of the water uh, or moisture can only go out of the top, uh, it's always better for concrete because it allows it a longer cure time. Typically takes over 30 days for the concrete to um, cure in these walls. And with that, you'll get a lot more MPA strength. So the concrete that starts out at 25 MPA quite often will end up um, cured out at around 28 to 30 MPA. So it's very hard uh, versus conventional walls because when you strip the forms off, right away the moisture gets sucked out so they don't get to uh, cure as, as uh, good as they, they should or could by virtue of doing it by uh, ICF. And you'll also see, if you can see, when the concrete's coming out of the tube now, um, when they did the bottom pour, they were pouring it at a thicker slump. So they started off at about a four inch slump. Now they're running up probably around six or seven inch uh, slump. So they add a lot more water to it as they uh, pour higher up in the wall so that it just uh, allows for less air to be in the concrete and it just flows a lot easier and it's easier to vibrate. Yeah, Louise, if you um, finished pouring today, uh, there's no reason why you couldn't start putting your um, your deck on this house tomorrow. You know, um, if you were ready to go tomorrow, you could basically start building on it. Uh, it'll be green, uh, of course, but um, it, because concrete has hardeners in it and heat in it, uh, it will set up. Uh, it's just, it takes longer to cure. Well, yeah, I give these guys credit too. Unlike my job sites where there was uh, typically a lot of profanity, these guys are pretty good. Uh, it doesn't matter if you pour in the rain or not, Lori. Um, we've done pours in the snow and the rain. The only thing you can't do uh, is if we had predictability of, um, you know, thunderstorms or lightning, uh, they absolutely will not allow you to pour during any type of lightning. Uh, just because you're sitting there with a nice um, electrified mast, if it gets hit by uh, lightning, everybody's going to be in a whole lot of trouble. <laughs> yeah, everybody was probably swearing at me. I always thought they were just swearing at the job. Well, third load of concrete's just coming around the corner, so we're rocking. Is Reed tuned in here? Say hi to him for me, or hi Reed. Is he not out on the ships anymore, Lori? Or the yachts? So I'll uh, play to see how the cement truck's setting up. So that's the third load that just arrived.
Yeah, not a problem, Scott. You know, this stuff for me is uh, it was a passion prior to getting into real estate. So I was really happy to see uh, my friend Paul had bought these lots and uh, that they're doing ICF construction here, at least on the basement portion of the house. And um, conventional building the rest of the way up. So like I said, I'll be doing a number of these uh, coming by weekly and uh, just talking about different elements of construction. So I'll always try and let everybody know a day ahead when I'm coming so that way you can tune in if you have questions I'll always do my best to answer them oh awesome for him I'm guessing he probably misses all the uh, nice weather that he was experiencing for all those years it's got to be one downfall of uh, being back in Canada No, actually, it's tougher in concrete. And it's always, um, it's always best when it comes to concrete, <clears throat> when you're dealing with uh, pours for ICF, to use somebody really reputable, uh, Dufferin, Lafarge. Um, you know, uh, we used to use, um, and I just can't think of it, orange trucks out of Barrie. Uh, Anyhow, it just always works. It's best to work with a more reputable companies when it comes to the concrete. The quality standards are higher and you really need that in the ICF. No, not James Dick. I just can't think of it. Um, company out of Barry. Quite often we used to use a company called Sargent. And reason for that too is the uh, sergeant's been around a long time and they used to have a yard in Bradford because most of my pours were in either Newmarket or Keswick. Um, we did the odd one in Toronto, mostly Georgina and Newmarket. Actually, a little thing, I used to be involved with uh, Habitat for Humanity at one time. I sat on their construction boards and helped them fundraise and uh, whatnot. So what we used to do is actually um, get all the product donated for them. So my ICF supplier used to donate all the block. Uh, at that time, we uh, had CBM donating concrete to us. So we were doing um, uh, Habitat for Humanity's houses. Uh, I did one in Keswick and one in Newmarket that we built the foundations like this out of ICF all on a volunteer basis so I got all the product donated and then uh, we did the pours uh, gratis for them and we were involved in building three of their houses actually uh, that we donated all the time of my company and crews and um, we're heavily involved with a uh, uh, habitat back in back in the uh, mid to late uh, 2005 to 10 period. Yeah, James Dick's been around a long time. Yeah, actually, one of the builds that I did for Habitat for Humanity is not far from here. We're on Bexhill. Um, build I did for them was on Bolton Avenue because the family had a uh, need to be very close to the hospital uh, so we did the uh, a build for uh, that particular family uh, just up the street from South Lake and then one of the ones I did in Keswick if anybody is watching this and you're familiar with Keswick 
Um, I owned land on Church Street in between Metro Road and the Queensway and there is one two-story house in amongst some old century homes there that um, I sold the land to Habitat and we then built a house. Uh, foundation was done in ICF and then the rest of the house was built conventionally. So as you can see, for the most part, it's interesting, but it's kind of like watching paint dry. Once you do a few of them. Yeah, Louise, actually, there will be a second house on this site, so I'll show you right now where the second house will be. So that is to the um, west side of the property, and this is a second lot that's right here. So this particular house is going to be a little bit bigger than the house that's um, currently being built. Uh, this, this has a lot more frontage. That particular piece of property there is roughly... 51 feet of frontage by uh, I think it's 130 feet deep um, and then this particular property is roughly 72 feet of frontage and it's a kind of a wedge-shaped property it's not as deep um, but it's going to allow for a bigger house just by virtue of the fact it's got a lot more frontage And anybody that's watching these particular um, videos that I'm going to do, um, some people are familiar with Newmarket. We're right in the thick of it here, so these lots are, our houses are going to be in fairly high demand uh, just because we're right in central and Newmarket. So, literally, if it wasn't for the fact that there's a fence in the way, uh, you could walk to the GO train from here in maybe four minutes. And, um, you know pick that up for anybody that's commuting to the city um, there's also old main street uh, literally we are on uh, main street north so uh, main street south which is full of great restaurants and coffee shops and you name it uh, boutiques all sorts of different stuff is literally a five minute to ten minute walk right down to the bottom of main street from here so there's great ice skating uh, there's there's just tons of things to do locally here uh, you can see some houses in the background. Uh, we're in a very mature, settled area here, so the houses all around here are um, typically 35 to 40 years old, 45 years, uh, depending on where you are in the subdivision. And these days, for three to four bedroom in this particular area, uh, resale. Um, there's one house just two doors up from this, just sold at 800 and change. So what we're seeing uh, from low to high here uh, on resale is anywhere from um, high sixes into the sevens up to as high as uh, 900 these days, 900,000. Um, these two properties here, depending on what he does with the finishes and how he finishes them out, uh, we're likely going to be um, probably somewhere in the 900,000 range by the time they go back on the market really depends on what the market does between now and then. Hi Chris. 
we're doing a concrete bore. So this is what I used to do for a living after I got out of uh, hauling the horses. And um, so I just thought people may have an interest in seeing what we're doing. So we're pouring concrete. Well, I'm not, my friend is. <laughs> Louise, uh, that's something you should uh, just keep to yourself. Oh, by the way, Louise, if you're uh, thinking about coming out for dinner this Saturday, um, we certainly won't be there. We'll be in Tennessee by then, but uh, touch base with Paul. Uh, chances are him and uh, Derek and some of those guys will probably show up. Yeah, the hammer drill you heard is probably um, Paul's brother over in the corner there. He's just putting in some pieces of plywood just to make sure that uh, nothing moves. He could actually putting, be putting screws in the top of the, um, the U-channels. No, he's just coming down the wall here, Lori, now. Um, he's not quite at the top of the wall yet. Yeah, it is, Scott. This is the perfect kind of weather. It's not too hot. Makes it easier for the guys because you're kind of under stress when you're doing these pours and, you know, you're moving around and lots of things to think about and make sure things don't go wrong. And it always beats uh, working in the rain or the snow. That's never a whole lot of fun. Yeah, there's people out for a walk, Louise. Everybody likes to check these things out. So you can see he's going on his final pour around here. Uh, he's getting up to the top of the wall. So what he'll usually, he'll probably do if he's like me is he'll slightly hump it up and then uh, they'll put the vibrator on it and uh, that'll all settle down. Uh, it says we're live here on my end, Lori. <laughs> Nosy neighbors. They're almost as bad as those Facebook Live people. Well, you got to have more questions, people. Come on. How about you, Louise? Can you hear me? Uh, 
Uh, the guy with the shovel, he's probably, uh, there's rebar driven in the ground there and turnbuckles, so. And this is what can happen sometimes when you're doing these pours. You get a lot of movement um, in the upper portion of the wall. So it may have um, it may have moved the scaffolding or the turnbuckling a little bit. So he's just putting the rebar deeper into the ground. Laurie, try and refresh. Go back or go out and go back in. We could be getting a little bit of wind noise. It's getting windier here. So, um, but you can hear me, right, Louise? Lori, I'm not sure if you're using um, an Android or a iPhone these days. If you're using an Android, just put your finger on the screen and pull down. It'll refresh it. I'm not sure what Apple does. I don't use Apple. So now you can see that um, the guy with the shovel and Roy who's walking around on the scaffold there, they're starting to check the wall and make sure that it's uh, straight. So they're, they're pushing the wall out now. Their scaffolding system's a little different from what I used to use. Um, what I used to use, we had a uh, hand crank style turnbuckle so you just basically turn the turnbuckle but uh, he's got a ratchet system so you'll see right now he's going to put his drill down and that'll that'll push the wall out what he's doing No, I don't imagine you're going to hear any cuss words, Louise. Uh, you know, if there was going to be a problem, it would have happened by now. They're at the top of the wall, so um, nothing's moved. All they're doing is straightening out the wall. And they'll just do a little bit more vibrating as they top off. And uh, pretty successful pour. What they'll end up doing too soon is because the... Um, There'll be a plate set on, uh, they'll set pins uh, just like you would in a traditional pour and conventional foundation. So they'll set a wood plate on top of that wall and um, they'll, they'll likely set pins. It is the perfect pour. And you'll see Roy there is going to start vibrating out the top of the concrete so he'll take any of the air that's out of it and it helps to pull the water up to the top too. What's that word, Louise? <laughs> oh, Lori, you ought to know if you're around me. It's never family programming. Gina coming with pizza. What did I miss? Somebody walking down the street with pizza? Oh, vibrate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, ladies.
Then they say men are bad. Yeah, that one will make your uh, teeth chatter. It's definitely industrial strength. Yeah, that's what I hear. Well, one thing's for sure, Louise, it'll give you your summer teeth. You know, summer here, summer there. I'm not even going to step into that one. I'll get myself in trouble. And you know, everything's recorded these days. Oh, you can hear that, can you? It's one of our listings. It's got a fair amount of showings being booked on it, so that's a good thing. Yeah, that's one of the only downfalls of Bex Hill. It's kind of a cut through street, um, leads into a, a larger subdivision here. So a lot of people tend to come up through here. do a spin okay so I'll show you what we got going on here Lori so I don't know if you were here when I was showing the wall but there's the wall a little over a hundred feet long probably about 125 feet end to end 25 feet at the high point um, back up here uh, there's a lot of people resting and they don't have the day off work they just got the day off life so there's a cemetery in behind us to the south side of these houses that's the west end so if you're familiar with Newmarket if you drove straight west from here you'd pretty much end up at um, Upper Canada Mall and there is another cemetery way back in the woods uh, that way facing to the north from here and there's Canada Post down there doing a three-point turn we'll watch them for a second and down right here uh, you can see a street that's running close by uh, that's old main street there so um, the guy that originally owned these properties owned some lots just up the hill uh, you can see some houses there 
he actually built um, five houses into a hill very similar to here and then uh, he relocated uh, to another part of Canada so he decided to sell these properties so right down there is Main Street itself and literally um, maybe a thousand feet from here is the GO train tracks so really good place uh, it's very quiet here with the exception of you get cut through traffic but you know that's only certain times of the day um, but the proximity to everything from here is excellent um, South Lake Regional Hospital is only literally no oh, five minute walk from here two minutes by ambulance God forbid so it's a great area uh, there's some really great schools in Newmarket here. Um, there's an arts school that's nearby, so um, Huron Heights is a, an arts school. That's actually where our daughter's probably going to be going to um, pursue her, her artistic talent. And you're welcome, Lori. Is that one for rednecks? <laughs> No rednecks here, too expensive. Yeah, she's a pretty amazing artist, uh, Lori. She's uh, got amazing sketch art capabilities. So um, we're going to have her keep working on that and then uh, have her get into um, graphic arts and visual arts. Hopefully she'll end up at some place like Disney or wherever she chooses to go. Well, I'm not sure what time it is. Uh, anybody have the time? Oh, I see it's just before 12. Thanks, Louise. Yeah, Brooke's very lucky. I'm artistic in my own endeavors, and Gina certainly is, so um, she certainly must have picked that up from both of us. So you can see Paul's working his way down the back wall here. Uh, they're pretty much done now. Um, he's just topping off the back wall. New message. Thanks, Louise. Yeah, you can come to Tennessee with us. We're leaving Friday, 3.30. Get on the bus. As soon as the kids are out of school, we're out of here. Well, Lori, that doesn't help me much. Come on. Golf cart was the bus.
Yeah, I don't blame you, Louise. I have a hard time myself every time we have to come back. I love the climate down there. Awesome, thanks, Lori. Yes, it is. Tennessee and Georgia, outside of uh, our water life in Florida, uh, we love Tennessee. If I had to go anywhere in the States on a permanent basis, that'd probably be where I'd go. First choice, besides California. Well, people, they're just about done here, so, um, and I have to move on with my day. How about Nova Scotia? Well, I like it there too, Lori. The only problem is all those freaking hurricanes that come up the East Coast, and they still get winter. And you know I don't like winter. I know you say it's only snow, and it's only rain. However... 75 degrees year-round just feels so good and palm trees Yeah, I will Lori so what I'll do is um, the probably uh, You know be monkeying around with different things here tomorrow and uh I'd imagine they'll probably start building the deck um, Friday on this particular house. Uh, we'll be gone next week. So as soon as I come back, I'll actually come back and do a live session uh, with whatever stage they're at. But I'll, I'll show you, you know, what they're going to do with the deck here and that because they're going to use engineered products. And I'll talk about a lot of different things that they do here. So I'll let you guys know. I'll give you a day's advance. I'll bring you back a crummy t-shirt, Louise, don't you worry. It's good to be chatting with you, Lori. We miss everybody out at the campground a ton. Anyhow, ladies, I'm going to check out. Uh, I have to move on with the rest of the day, and these guys are done. But if you have questions, anytime, just uh, reach out and post them on here or ask me anything you ever need to know about construction. I'll be happy to answer anything I know. Have a good day, everybody.